All right, well, now we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation. Uh, it happened from 1517 to 1648, uh, both symbolic dates. Uh, the, the picture there is Martin Luther in Germany posting his 95 Thesis to a church in Wittenberg, Germany, which symbolically started the Reformation. There were, there were previous people who were talking about change in the church, but this is what we generally accept as the symbolic start. So let's get into it and find out who Martin was and some other changes that happened in France and England and Spain. Uh, who some other reformers were, and what the Catholic Church did to kind of counter the Reformation. <clears throat> so these are things I want you to take out of the course. You can pause on this, take a look at it. We're going to understand what the Catholic Church was and the Pope before and after the Reformation. What were the? I want you to restate and tell me the causes of the Reformation. Discuss the impact of the printing press, which we talked about as one of those innovations during the Renaissance that's now going to really come into play. We're going to talk about key points of the Reformation, and you've got them listed there. We'll have separate slides on those and talk about why they're important. We're going to explain the results of the Catholic Reformation, <clears throat> what they looked at. And we're going to talk about good old Henry VIII uh, and his creation of the Anglican Church in England. And then I want you to take a look and explain the impact of the Reformation in France, Germany, and Spain. So let's get into it here. Back in 1500, the Catholic Church was the most dominant and powerful institution in Europe. They controlled everything. They controlled what information went out. They controlled the kings. They controlled what schools there were. They owned everything. And about 50% of the property that was owned in all of Europe, if you look at your map, was owned by the Catholic Church. It was led by the Pope and still is located by the Pope in the Vatican in Rome. And prior to this Reformation, all Christians were Roman Catholic. There wasn't anything else. You had Jews and you had Roman Catholics. You also had Islam, which we talked about before, and Buddhism and Hinduism. They were in their respective areas. But this Reformation is going to specifically only talk about the Reformation against the Catholic Church. The problem with the church was a lot of people thought it was corrupt. <clears throat> uh, people resented how wealthy the church was and the the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, but they didn't pay taxes. They lived in these elegant palaces. They wore jeweled robes while poor people were poor, and these guys were members of the church. Why weren't they dressed more modestly and looking like they represented God instead of money? They were worldly, or they had worldliness. Uh, they were immoral and dishonest. There were priests who were having children. There were priests who were stealing money. Uh, they broke several vows, and they people were upset because they weren't acting like humble servants of God. So the Catholic Church headquarters is in Rome. They believe in seven sacraments or holy things that you have to do as a Catholic. Much like the five pillars of faith for Islam, Catholics have the seven sacraments. And they're listed there. And then you have down here, you have depictions of each one of them from stained glass windows. But then they had a problem. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica, which you see in the picture, here's the inside at the bottom. It's very beautiful inside. It's, uh, it's strikingly beautiful. And that was kind of the whole point, was to make it the envy of the whole Christian church. This is the outside in the Vatican. Uh, it had fallen into disrepair, meaning it, it had not been maintained and maintenance been done on it for several hundred years. So Pope Leo said, hey, let's rebuild it. It did not look like this at all uh, back in the 1500s uh, when it first started. So he's like, we need to make some money. So how can we make money? So he started to sell something called an indulgence. So let's figure out what that is. But this made a lot of people very mad. So this was really the height of papal corruption. And you'll see Pope Leo X with to, with his cardinals, Luigi de Rossi and Guido de Medici. Now, if you remember in our classes on the Reformation, the Medici were a powerful family in Florence. Guess which family Pope Leo came from? He was one of the four Medicis who became Pope. And Raphael, we talked about Raphael during the Renaissance. He painted this painting. So what did Pope Leo do to solve his problem of needing money? Because all the money had been spent on other things, and that's why people were upset. He needed money to build St. Peter's Basilica. So his solution, 
very simple in a corrupt way he sold church offices somebody said they wanted to be a cardinal he said give me x amount of money and they were a cardinal somebody wanted to be a priest they paid money and they were a priest did they have to be educated did they have to follow the rules did they have to go through the certifications no they just had to pay money so it was really the powerful families that bought these church offices that made people mad and then indulgences I mentioned on the last slide he sold these so what are these indulgences that we're talking about it's one of five problems that the people had with the church and a simple way to remember everyone is mad the first one I stands for indulgences it's a release from punishment for your sins in exchange for money so you could go out and commit a sin Go to the church, pay a certain amount of money that was, you know, like a grocery list or a menu on a restaurant. You pay this amount of money and you don't have to worry about um, your soul after death. You don't have to go to purg purgatory and you can go to heaven a lot faster for your sins. Well, this kind of upset the poor people because they couldn't afford these indulgences so they their salvation was in question while the rich people their salvation wasn't in question because they would commit sins and they would just pay the church to pay off their debt for their sin then you had simony which is the selling of church offices to the highest bidder and then these people would get these high jobs and then they would tax the poor which led to corruption the church was supposed to be holy servants of God but yet they were not treating the people very good and then merchants, they wanted to charge interest on loan money, high interest charges, like loan shark interest. You borrow money, they wanted to charge 50%. The church said this was wrong. It's called usury, U-S-U-R-I, right here. The church said it's wrong to charge an, a lot of interest on loan money. Charging interest is fine, but don't be extravagant at it. Well, that upset the merchants, and the merchants had a lot of money, and they were upset at the church. People were upset at the absolute wealth and power. Look at inside St. Peter's here, how beautiful and ornate this is. Uh, why did it have to be that way when there were poor people? People were questioning the church. And then people, Germans and the English, were mad, and they felt alienated. Alienated means separated from the group by the church because all the popes were Italian. How did they know how Germans and the people in England felt about things? So they were upset because it was Italians everywhere not racist but Italians just couldn't understand the Germans and English so they wanted a German Pope or an English Pope so those are the is mad remember everyone is mad problems with the Catholic Church so we just talked about an indulgence you'll kind of see one down here playing in the video It grants forgiveness for your sins and it lessens the time your soul has to spend in purgatory, which you have to atone for your sins, as is believed the Catholic. Well, Luther, certain people didn't agree with that. And I, like I already mentioned, the poor people especially did not agree with that. So who benefited? The rich. Who loses? The poor people. So this Reformation, what is it? That's the whole block of instruction here. It's an attempt to reform the Catholic Church to get rid of corruption and restore the people's faith in the church. The Reformation did not want to break away from the church. They just wanted the church to fix what it thought was wrong. It turned into something different. Some early reformers here, John Wycliffe, early on the 1300s, he's talking about people should be able to read the Bible on their own. He was interested in the authority of the clergy. Did they have certain biblical rights? What, what could they do and not do? John Hus, right here, he wanted bishops elected, not appointed by the Pope. He wanted the people to have a say in their religious leaders. And for his, quote, heresy, teaching against the church, that's what heresy means, he was burned at the stake for his beliefs in 1415. And then Erasmus, we talked about him in, as a humanist, uh, writer from Holland uh, 
I'm sorry, from Denmark. He wrote about the he wrote the praise of folly. We mentioned that in the Renaissance class where he made fun of the church and people of wealth in the Renaissance. So there were some early reformers, but it really didn't start until Brother Martin Luther. Uh, he is a friar in the Catholic Church, which is just below a priest, uh, but he's more than just a regular layperson, which is someone who just reads the Bible. But he was troubled by the sale of indulgences, uh, the indulgences, the sale of salvation, and other practices of the church. He lived in Germany. So in March, in uh, October of 1517, so this will be the 500th year, he went to the church door and posted 95 theses or his problems that he had with the church to start a discussion, saying, hey, why are we doing these things? Let's just think about it. He put it on the church door, but the church door was the bulletin board of the day. That was the Internet. That's where you went to read things. A lot of things were posted to the church door. Why? Because everybody went to church. That's the one place you knew everybody would see it. Uh, and again, his intent was to reform or to, quote, fix the Catholic Church, not break away from it. He was a very devout Catholic. So he had his problems. These are some of them. He didn't like the indulgences. He didn't think they had the power to remit sin or to cancel sin. He criticized the Pope and the wealth. And his theses were written in Latin for church leaders, not the common people. But somebody took them, translated them to German, started printing them on the printing press, and it got retweeted around Europe. So this stimulated discussion. Like I mentioned, doors about bulletin boards. Uh, university intellectuals read it, and they started discussing it, and a lot of them agreed with what he was saying. They just were too scared to say it beforehand. It was published and sent around Europe. Uh, there's, I saw an uh, a, a uh, show one time on TV talking about Martin Luther and he said within 10 days of his thesis being converted into or posted in 10 days it was printed in Spanish and was in Spain that's pretty quick for back then and it grew a desire for reform among the average person because they could read it so again the church said pardons are good Luther said no they're not there's no basis in the Bible and the Pope has no authority to release souls from purgatory because it's not in the Bible. Uh, the church believed you do faith uh, salvation or being your soul being saved is through faith and good works. Luther said, nope, only faith alone. The church viewed the Bible as not the only source, but the Pope and the clergy could also make rules. Luther said, nope, sorry, it's only the Bible is the only source of truth. And the church had the seven sacraments. We talked about those earlier. Martin Luther only believed in two, uh, baptism and communion. So how did word spread quickly? We just talked about this a moment ago. Uh, it was the printing press. It made it possible for his beliefs to go everywhere. Printing press was started earlier. One of these printing presses had just arrived recently into Wittenberg, where he lived. So when, his posted, when he posted his uh, thesis on the wall, somebody wrote them down, went over, started publishing them. Uh, and it was printed in the vernacular. Vernacular means your native language. So it was printed in Spanish, so the Spanish could read it. It was printed in German. It was printed in French. It was printed in English. So the people in local countries could read it in their language. So here's the printing press. It now made books available to the masses, not just the rich. The more you print, the more, the less you can charge, the more money you can make. Uh, it made printing cheaper. In the old days, when you were handwriting, you could do maybe 40 pages a day. With the printing press, you're doing 3,600 pages a day. That's a lot. That's a whole Bible you could do. That's 3,600 leaflets you could print up. And if you had two machines, that's, that's equally impressive. The machines are pretty simple. The hard part was the press tiles that you're seeing somebody here put together with the letters. It caused people to have access to books whenever they wanted them. It was a rise in literacy rates. People started to learn to read because they started to learn to read the Bible, which was the first book printed, and it was printed in many languages. 
So once they could read the Bible, they could read other things. So what was the reaction to this Luther guy? Well, he gained a lot of support from the people because a lot of the people were poor, poor, including a lot of the princes in the Holy Roman Empire, which was kind of the middle of Germany, what we call Germany today. It was a huge um, collection of nations and states. Millions of people converted to Islam and said, or to, excuse me, millions of people converted to Lutherism and told the Catholic Church goodbye. Uh, he, get, they get, he gained criticism from the church. The Catholic Church did not like this. They even threatened to excommunicate Luther, which means kick him out of the church and damn his soul. If he didn't recant, which means take back his teachings. So that several people brought him in, Charles V. Uh, the Pope asked for him to come to Rome. He didn't go. Uh, he never recanted. He said, I am preaching what the Bible says. How can I be wrong? So the church excommunicated him. They went by Felicia and they kicked him out of the church. And he was not upset about that because he believed he was right. And so he was excommunicated. Those who followed him were called Lutherans. Martin Luther didn't like the concept of that in his writings. He writes, why would you name it after me? I teach after Christ. I'm just telling them what's in the Bible. And that became a new Christian denomination. So you had the Catholics and Lutherans. Uh, Lutherans are also called Protestant because at the time they were protesting papal authority. Protestant, protest, means I'm against. I want you to change something. Later on, there would be other uh, denominations or categories or types of Christianity. And we'll talk about a, a few here in a minute. Now, just so you know, the, uh, there were women who were involved in this movement as well. Argula von Grumbach, she was in uh, a very noble family, which means a royalty, if you will, in Bavaria. She challenged the university faculty to a debate because they tried to force a student to recant Lutheranism. And the student was like, no, I'm not going to say that I don't believe in Lutherism because I do. She heard about it, and she forced him to a debate and debated him and told him that they were wrong. Uh, of course, at that time, women weren't supposed to do that. Uh, her views, uh, she had a lot of public opposition, mainly from men. Women didn't oppose her, um, but nobody else would. Uh, because she went out and did what she thought was right, the right ethical thing. She was threatened, she was bullied, she was name-called, uh, but she went through and persevered and did what she thought was right. She wrote, met and wrote often with Martin Luther, and she encouraged other women to advocate for themselves. So you can see here, there's Wittenberg, here's kind of the spread of Protestantism, Protestantism English, whoo, started here in Wittenberg, Went up to Sweden, Norway, saw the green there. Um, some folks down in Switzerland heard about it. Uh, they started uh, the Calvinist and in France. So that changed things. They went up into Scotland and over in here. So this is just kind of the start of it early on. So here's this guy, John Calvin. Uh, he led the Reformation in France. He broke from the Catholics in 1530 after reading about from Martin Luther, and he agreed with a literal interpretation of the Bible. But he had a new idea, a new idea called predestination, where God determined before you were born whether you would be saved and go to heaven or whether you would be go to hell or whether you would be a slave. Uh, his, his teachings further expanded Protestant movement. But his, his followers were called Calvinist. Luther didn't believe in predestination. John Calvin did. Uh, and he created a theocracy for his movement. A theocracy is when the church leads the church and religion and God leads the nation. So his movement wanted to have church and state together. So what happened? Uh, John Calvin, his movement spread into France. And then you had the Edict of Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. This is 1598. Remember, Calvin started in 1530. So this is, what, 68 years, which is longer than most people lived back then. But this Edict of Nantes granted the Huguenots, which is a French word for Calvinist, so just followers of John Calvin, 
gave them the freedom to practice their Protestant religion in France. So it took 68 years for the king to say, okay, this is fine. You can practice Protestantism in France. That's a long time. So what about England? There's a uh, good old King Henry VIII of England. Uh, and that's the last painting that was done of him by uh, Mr. Holbein. He was Roman Catholic, because everybody was, unless you're a Catholic, uh, Calvinist or a Lutheran. He opposed Martin Luther. Uh, he supported the church during the Reformation. He's like, hey, no, you need to be part of the Catholic Church. He married a Catholic woman from Spain, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, but he became a reformer not because he disagreed with the church, but because of a personal reason uh, and a political reason. And here they are. His personal reason he wanted a divorce from his first wife so he could have a son. She gave him a daughter. He was worried. She was getting older. He wanted a younger wife to have a son. And he was tired of sharing power with the church. But again, all the popes were Italian. They, it made the German and the English mad. So he's like, hey, you know, I want to be able to control my country independently of the church. So that's why he became a reformer. So on to his personal thing. He needs a divorce. The Catholic Church doesn't do divorce or didn't do divorce back then. He was married to Catherine of Aragon and she could not produce a male child, someone to take over the throne. They had a child. It was Mary Tudor. She later became the first queen of England. She ruled for five years. But back then, if you didn't have a male son, males couldn't go to the throne. Or females couldn't, so his, his family would die out. He asked the Pope for an annulment, meaning the marriage never happened uh, because she was uh, married before her husband died. Uh, there were some other reasons in there that we just don't need to get into here. It's just too complicated. But anyway, he's asked for an annulment. In other words, the marriage never happened, so let me marry somebody else, somebody who can give me a male heir. The Pope said no. And King Henry went, well, bye, Felicia. And he left the Catholic Church. And he said, we're not going to be Catholic. He created the Church of England called the Anglican Church. Anglican is an older way of saying England. And he established supremacy over it. He became the head of the Anglican Church, which by the act of supremacy, uh, he made him the only person on earth as head of the Catholic Church. Uh, many refused to accept Henry as the head of the church, and uh, they were executed. Uh, Sir Thomas More that we read about back in the uh, Reformation, the English writer who was a good friend of King Henry the uh, Eighth. They were friends together. They were in school together, but King Henry had him killed because he didn't agree with what King Henry was doing. And after all this, the Pope excommunicated Henry the Eighth from the Catholic Church. So King Henry, now that he's in charge of his own religion, he granted himself a divorce from Catherine of Aragon and married Anne Boleyn. Uh, they, he actually married her before they were divorced, they think, so might have been some overlap. He might have been married at the same time to two women. He was hoping for a male child, but Anne gave him a girl. She had several other pregnancies that just didn't last. And then he got... She got in some trouble, kind of disrespected the king, so he had her executed. He was actually married several more, four more times. Let me go back to that. He was actually married four more times, had a son later on uh, by his third wife. So he would later become king, Mary would become king, and then... The girl that they gave, that Anne gave him, Elizabeth, she would become queen as well. Queen Elizabeth, very powerful and long running. We'll talk about her in a moment. So here's kind of where we are with the branches of Christianity. Had Christianity, they had a great schism between Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic. If you took World History One, you know about that. So there's two types of Catholicism. Well, in 1517, Protestants started breaking off, and you had Martin Luther with the Lutherans. The Anglicans, Henry VIII started that, and John Calvin with the Calvinists. They would later become the Puritans that would go to Massachusetts uh, from England, uh, the Pilgrims. 
the Huguenots, which are in France, and the Presbyterians, which would wind up in Scotland, but they're all Calvinists. So what are some differences between Catholics and Protestants today? Uh, here's clothes the Catholics priests wore back in the 16th century. You know, look at how ornate they are. Notice Christ in the middle. Uh, and here are clothes worn by pre Protestant preachers. Very simple, very plain, nothing ornate, uh, because they're they're trying to be more humble. Remember, what was one of their complaints is the priests were wearing ornate clothes and clothes and living like they were rich when they shouldn't be. They should be humble servants of God. It's just a different. Neither one's right or wrong. They're just different. Uh, the Protestant churches they had a new prayer book. They no longer spoke in Latin. All of them were in English or German or French. Priests were allowed to marry. And they took down decorative art from churches. It was uh, the Protestants considered them against the Ten Commandments, one of which says you will have no graven images or idols. So they took those down and just had crosses. No big pictures of Jesus, not a lot of famous art, not a lot of decorative. And we'll see an example in a minute. So this is a Protestant altar. It's very plain. No art on the walls. Uh, and again, no art because they kind of thought it was against the Ten Commandments. But here's a Catholic altar. It's very religious and decorative. The Catholics do it because it has the saints. There's Joseph, Mary, other saints and angels. Very ornate. Makes you think of the, of the glory of God, the regalness of God. Um, there's Christ being sacrificed on the cross. They're both served the, the purpose intended. Neither one's right, neither one's wrong. Here's a Protestant church, very plain on the outside, uh, because they're concerned about what's going on the inside with people. And here's a Catholic church, very big, very grand, lots of stained windows, very pretty on the side. Again, trying to show the glory of God. So let's talk about this Catholic Counter-Reformation, where the Catholic Church was trying to stop the spread of this Protestantism. Protestantism. Protestantism, woo, that's a hard one to say. It was losing followers, which meant they were losing money. So the Council of Trent, where church leaders met for 20 years, look at that, 20 years, and didn't start until 1545. Luther posted in 1517, his movement started growing, and what, about 30 years, 28 years later, the church decided to do something about it. They met for 20 years to make reforms which they made very few reforms. They just ended up saying, yep, everything we believe is what we believe, and we're not changing anything. But they did take certain action to end some church abuses. I don't need to get into what they are, but they made a little bit of, of effort, but they really didn't take care of the concerns of other people that the Protestants had. Uh, they did create the Society of, the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits, uh, it was created by uh, Ignatius of Loyola. He was a priest. He was a religious leader. He was devoted to the Catholic Church. But it was the purpose of these was to defend and spread the Catholic faith around, faith around the world. They sent missionaries out to Asia, Africa, the Americas, uh, to preach and try to convert those people, those different cultures, to Catholicism. And he founded Catholic schools uh, to better train priests. Uh, Xavier University in Cincinnati is a Jesuit school, uh, and, and there are others out there. So that was their purpose, is to go out and counter um, Protestant, Protestantism by sending missionaries out to gather more people so they could tax them and make more money that way, to spread the Catholic faith, Catholic faith, and to better train priests to try and get rid of some of the injustices uh, and abuses they were doing. So how did Protestantism spread even more? Well, Protestant England would spell, would send um, the Anglican Church over to England, or over to the United States, well, what is to America now, I just wish what is now the United States, because the United States is predominantly Protestant. And Catholics went to Portugal, Mexico, and South America, which is why most of them down there are now Catholic. Or were at the time. So what happened in some other countries? 
We talked about England a minute ago. Uh, France, we had the Edict of Nantes that said that the Calvinists could practice their faith. Well, in Spain, they had something called the Inquisition. And this was a very bad time. It lasted for 300 years. But it was the purpose, it was dominated by Catholics because they were trying to protect the Catholic faith. But it was to identify a heretic, which is somebody who talks bad about the church and somebody who preaches opposite of the church preachings. So any heretics from recent converts to Christianity, because they would almost force a lot of people. They were trying to focus on Muslims and Jews. They were trying to convert them to Catholicism. They would kick them out of the country. They would torture them, or they would just kill them for not being Catholic. Uh, it was not a very good time to be not Catholic in Spain. These are some of the ways they would do it. They would uh, drip, drip hot oil and wax onto you as you hung upside down until you confessed. They would put your feet over fire until you confessed. They would crush your head into a vice. They would pull you on the rack. They would hang you with weights down until you did it. Burn you on, turn you on a rack with heat underneath of it. Uh, poke, looks like poking you with sharp sticks. They would pull you different ways and cut off your wind. Uh, burn you and lean you up until you, you burned or you confessed. Not a good time. So how about Germany? Well, we talked earlier about in, 18, in 1555, again, which is what, almost, almost 40 years after Martin Luther nailed his um, theses to the door, King uh, Charles V said German princes could decide for their own state if they wanted to be Catholic or Protestant. So it basically ended the Pope's authority within their states and within the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, in what we, we're calling it Germany for simplicity's sake, if you want to know more, but it's kind of all of Middle Europe. And then that led to, because if you got a Catholic, a Catholic region right beside a Protestant region, they would have a war, which led to the Thirty Years' War, starting in 1618 and lasting until 1648. That was a very devastating war between Protestants and Catholics. Um, it had all those countries involved. It was mainly fought on German soil. Uh, but it ended with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 that basically said, hey, Catholics, you can be Catholics, Protestants, you can, pro you can practice your faith, which is what they had before. So nothing was really solved except for a lot of death and destruction. But generally speaking, because of the result of um, legalizing, if you will, the Protestant faith in those countries, that's generally termed as the end of the major reform movements. If you remember the first slide we showed was the reform, the Reformation was 1517 to 1648. Well, here's your end of 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the big majority movement of what we're going to cover for the Reformation. So in England, King Henry dies. His son takes over for a few, few years. Mary comes in, Bloody Mary. She's in for like five years. She takes, she gets rid of the, the Anglican church. She goes back to Catholic because her mother was Catholic. She kills a bunch of Protestants because she, she bloody married. She eventually dies because she's older. And then Elizabeth takes over. Elizabeth very much loved her father, Henry VIII. And she was raised as an Anglican. Um, Mary before her was raised Catholic because of her mother. But Elizabeth makes the Anglican Church the official Church of England. And for that, she is excommunicated by the Pope and the Catholic Church. But which she's fine with because she's, she's Anglican. She never was a Catholic anyway. She gave a tolerance to Catholics, most about, mostly out of respect for her sister and her faith, because she loved her sister, and for the people, because she, didn't, she wanted her people to be united in love for country and practice their own faith. She led a lot of expansion, expansion and colonialism of the British Empire. And her victory over the Spanish Armada, and an Armada is a um, large fleet of ships that was coming to invade England. She defeated them in 1588, and because now Spain doesn't have a large navy, because they're off the bottom of the English Channel, uh, England becomes a huge world power, which was going to lead us into our empires, which is our next block 
uh, of learning here in world history. So after the Reformation, you can see where Lutherism is, all this gold, uh, a lot of Roman, a lot of countries are still Roman Catholic. All the yellow, obviously Italy here. Uh, Calvinists are in the the little teal or wherever that is. There's a lot of it's a lot of Catholics in here, but still got a lot of Protestant minorities. The Ottomans are out here, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and everything in this uh, what is more of an orange, red orange. These are all is these are all Muslims or Islam. So that's kind of what it looked like after the Reformation. Now here's just a timeline that's really good for you. You got the printing press. So it kind of puts all these dates into a real sequence of events for you. So Gutenberg invents, invents this movable type printing press. Erasmus starts, he printishes in Praise of Folly in 1509. Thomas More publishes Utopia, talking about things in 1517. Same time Luther posts his 95 theses on the church. The Bible becomes published in German in 1534. People start reading it. King Henry VIII in England says, Bye to the Catholic Church, creates the Anglican Church. In 1545, this Council of Trent, the Catholic... So anything on this side is the Catholic actions. Sorry, I didn't explain that. The blue is Catholic actions. The pink is any Protestant actions. The Council of Trent meets to kind of stop all this that's going on down here. Like, wait a minute, we got to do something. This is not a good thing. Uh, the Peace of Augsburg that grants the princes in the Holy Roman Empire the ability to say if they want to be Protestant or Catholic Council of Trent ends no real action the Edict of Nantes in France that says Huguenots can practice their Protestant faith then you have the Thirty Years War all this while the Catholic Reformation is still trying to go on and finally ends in 1648 after the Thirty Years War with the Peace of Westphalia which goes back again saying yes Protestants are a legal faith you can practice them here and you decide what you want to do so that's really the Reformation in a nutshell um, that didn't take too long uh, but it took many years to develop it didn't just start happening like today when you have social media the social media then was the printing press the social media back then was people traveling and trade it began over issues with the Catholic Church remember everyone is mad uh, yet these are the kind of the three important leaders you need to know: Martin Luther, John Calvin, King Henry VIII, and their their you know the impact they made on the movement. Uh, once you understand about the printing press, it had a great impact on spreading the ideas. And again, that was kind of the internet of the day. That's how people got messages out. It just took longer. And the results of it, honestly, in the middle there was a lot of destructive wars between Catholics and Protestants. It really didn't end and solve anything, um, except a lot of death and destruction. But it, the, the time period we're talking really ended with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. It basically said, okay, Protestantism is an authorized legal religion. So with that, I think uh, you've got a good overview. I hope it helps you study a little bit. And we'll see you with the next block of instruction.